Hey everybody, um, this is a Nightworms exclusive video for you, for our Nightworms. I am Sadie Mother Horror. I am the co-owner of Nightworms, and this is my better half, Ashley. I always say that, but we're not really married. I mean, kind of. I see her a lot and talk to her like as much as I talk to my husband. Um, Ashley Spookish Mommy. There she is. Um, and with us today, our special guests, um, author Ronald Malfi and richard chismar hi guys hello how are you good i'm good i mean i have allergies i was just telling ashley so if my voice like cuts out like a bad recording like that's what that is <laughs> i moved to washington from california and i guess you have to get used to a whole new set of pollens when you do something like that yeah and this year's been brutal I'm in <laughs> yeah. well actually rich and i are in both I was in say. yeah and it's been uh it's been pretty awful over here it's been yeah. hot, muggy, and allergy the whole summer. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you guys know each other in real life? Are you like real life friends? Uh, well, I've, I've, I think Rich, I think I've met you once in person. I was at a book signing with you and your Was son. it just once, or was it more? Was uh, it twice? It could have been twice. I yeah, I don't remember. Yeah. Uh, and Rich is, uh, you, you're probably what, 40 minutes from me, but yeah, we um, need to freaking get together for lunch and stuff. And we've said this a million <laughs> times. I've got like the open invitation to come uh, check out Cemetery Dance's headquarters, and and yeah. similar to Rich, I like to hole up in my house and not do anything. <laughs> but you know, yeah, you're you're exactly right. Why we shouldn't do this? And and in fact, I think it was uh, it's a Tom Monteleone who who was was also threw his hat in the ring. He's like, hey, you guys want to come into the city? We'll we'll go to lunch, and uh, I, I'm well, sure Tom, we can get actually lives, uh, Tom actually lives like less than ten minutes away from me. Yeah. No, I know. So, yeah. And Keen, so, Brian Keen lives like, you know, an hour over the Pennsylvania line, something like yeah. that. So, yeah, we, there's a bunch of us around here. Oh, absolutely. Is yeah. there really a, a cemetery dance headquarters? Oh, yeah. Yeah. We've got um, in an air park, we've got two big warehouses with office space and and tons of, uh, of warehouse and packing space and all that. So, yeah, you guys are welcome anytime you want. Oh, I would love that. I really would actually love that. Do you yeah. mostly work from home or do you go in? Yeah, I'm a, this is my home office. I uh, I used to go in every day until a couple of years ago. And now I, I'm i kind of like a phantom. I ghost in and, and and drop off checks for printers and royalties and all that stuff. And, and then I just get out of there because I, you know, I'm only five minutes or like seven minutes away from from CD. So um, but I've got a great setup here and, and with with the Internet and and we used to text each other at the office sometimes and, and you could hear Mindy and Brian out there yelling, why aren't you just walking out and telling me this? <laughs> um, so the texting yeah, no, so much easier. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, but no, we've had offices for a while. I mean, CD went from uh, a two bedroom apartment to a garage, to a basement, to real offices, probably 20 years ago, something like that. Wow. wow. Cool. That is cool. Um, so in case our nightworms live under a rock and aren't aware, we posted that um, this package that we're doing with you guys in August, your names are on them, so on the graphic. So we're pretty sure they know which books are coming to them. Right. Um, but just in case they don't, you know, this is spoiler alert. You're going to find out what it is because we're going to talk about those books. Um, but Richard Chismar is the author of the upcoming book, Chasing the Boogeyman. And Ronald Malfi is the author of Come With Me, which, guess what, just came in 23 boxes, a giant shrink-wrapped pallet to my house yesterday and was full of these books. It's a lot chunkier than I actually was anticipating. So it's around three, 400. Is that right? Uh, it's four, 400, yeah. And yeah, it's small, I read it's small typeface. So, you know, my mother had to get like an extra pair of glasses to read. <laughs> oh, I'm glad I just got glasses. <laughs> um, so the theme is small town scares. So it's going to be uh, really fun. And uh, Sadie and I were just saying that uh, this is actually the second time Ronald Malfi is in a Nightworms package. Yeah, that's right. I actually just pulled my stack because I always do that. But here's my Ronald Malfi there this way. There's my Ronald Malfi stack, and this is the book that we did with Thunderstorm, which was uh, a reprint of Snow, a special edition of Snow um, that Ronald signed for us. So we're excited about that. But um, 
And then Richard Chismar's book, Chasing the Boogeyman, I actually just refreshed myself on the synopsis because usually I just gloss over the the points on the back because I like to go into my books blind. But when I reread it, I am stoked for this book. Like, it, you, first of all, first of all, it's like this mishmash of the small time, small town horror and like true crime, but you wrote yourself into the novel as well. Oh yeah, I did. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, it was, it, you know, it was pretty much the only way I felt like the story could be told, you know, it wasn't the original plan. I sat down kind of with just this little German of, of an idea. Um, but as soon as I started writing about the town and kind of uh, got to the point where I wanted to kind of set the scene of, of, you know, time and place and kind of let people know, you know, get a feeling for that time period in this specific place. Uh, it was, it became really obvious that, that I couldn't write about a carry, you know, Ron will tell you, we, we put ourselves in, in some of our characters um, <laughs> and it's usually pretty easy to do because you can kind of slide, you know, a thought or a, a belief system or, or, you know, uh, you know, dialogue, the way we talk or the way we think into a, a character, uh, you know, but you're mixing it with a whole bunch of, you know, make believe. And with this guy, it, it just became really evident early on that he was going to be me um, because the town was real. The setting was real. Everything in the book was real except for those four girls being murdered. So, yeah, I kind of had no choice. And it, it uh, for someone who likes to stay behind the scenes, it was, you know, it, it was it was an odd decision. Let's put it that way. My agent was like, you did what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, is it obvious that it's you? Like, is his name oh, Richard or? Is yeah, it <laughs> no, it's been. Even on yeah. the jacket, it's it's you know young budding author and publisher Richard Chismar. Because yeah, it, it, it was written about me as a 22 year old, which is you know year two of Cemetery Dance, and I'm just about to put out the first issue, and and I'm selling my short stories to these little magazines for for pennies, and um, with really no idea whether any of it's going to work. So it was an interesting time in my life. Yeah, um, I w we were also talking about how if I like, I go by like title, book cover and author. So like Rich, your book, I'm like, I don't really, I didn't even like really read the synopsis because I don't really want to know. I just saw like, okay, I heard true crime. I heard small town that covers awesome. Sounds amazing. And like, that's what I did with come with me too. I'm like, I, I don't really know what they're about, but I'm going to go into them and find out. Yeah. You know, I, Okay. I, I want to interject over Rich because this is probably his book is probably my most anticipated uh, book that's been coming out. And I, you know, I love Rich's writing and I've, I've read his stuff, but, um, and I don't know if it's just a writer thing or if, if readers in general feel this way, but the, the synopsis sounded great on the book and everything. What really sold me is that narrative device. When, when I was reading, I'm like, Whoa, he's a, the fictionalized character in his own book. I said, I gotta, I'm dying to see how you, how you pulled this off because I want to know how much, um, of your like when i read about yourself how fictionalized is the fictional version how 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 much is it not um i don't know if you ever read uh brett easton ellis's lunar park where he does mm -hmm. similar, I, I love how he does that and i i went after i read that book i went back i'm like oh none of none of his personal stuff is is real in that novel he just he fabricated the whole thing it's really amazing and i'm dying to see <clears throat> like how you did this it's been like you know my most anticipated book oh well thanks yeah I, i'll i actually should have sent you an arc before this so i ran out of yeah. art and you know that. And, and then i got a bunch more from simon and schuster so i can send you one um but uh yeah, I, yeah. Not to belabor the point, but it was just an odd choice for me to make because, like I said, I you know I like to kind of stay in the background. But but uh, it's just what happened, and you know my agent is very kind, but you know was honest in the beginning. She's you know you did what? And I was like, well, just read it and see what you think. And then she, before she read it, she said, well, if we get a positive response to this, but they want to change you know the main character to you know, someone completely fictional, um, would you be open to that? And I said, probably, depending on, you know, who it is and, and, and what the deal is. And fortunately, she read it. And like a week later, she's like, Nope, you can't change it. You got to leave it. So. Um, so yeah, it was one of those happy accidents that hopefully will make me look smart in the long run. Like, this was <laughs> right from day one. And, you know, I'll beg you to get this video off the internet so I can tell everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, people write about authors and, and um, you know, I don't know if they're semi-autobiographical or what, but you were just out in front about it. But, I mean, there are tons of horror stories where there's an author involved, Stephen King, 
has a couple, um, you know, like I just read, I read a Jonathan Jans one last year that has a, a or Siren and the Spectre has, you know, a, a, a writer. And I mean, so it just seems like you guys, when you write what you know, um, you might as well just be upfront about it and be like, hey, it's just actually me that I'm talking about here. <laughs> uh, I think it's cool. I'm, I'm really excited about it. It's a cool concept. Well, thanks. Was um, December Park kind of semi auto well, you know what I'm trying to say. Can't yes. say that word. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. December Park is is pretty auto, you know, except for some of what Rich was saying, except for the dead people in, in, his, in his book. Same with mine. Uh, you know, the, the guys in that book are guys I grew up with. It's told first person from a main character. You know, the main character is from my point of view. Um, you know, and it's it's funny because some of the criticism on that book was, well, here's here's just another coming of age horror novel where the main protagonist is is a writer, although he's a kid in the in the story. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, no shit. I mean, what when you write a, a, a an autobiography or a semi autobiographical book and you're a writer, what do you? What, I'm not an auto mechanic. What am I going to do? Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it kind of is, was a no brainer. But uh, yes, this December Park was that way with a uh, gorgeous limited edition published by Cemetery Dance. When that I was going to say that was my favorite, you know, book by you until the new one. Um, Thanks. Man. Did you have more fun writing December Park because of that than some of your other books or was it more I, difficult or? I have just a question. Yeah. Yeah. That's the medallion uh, press paperback. Um, no, I had a blast writing December Park. I first, it was one of the few books. Normally when I write a book, it's just as what I, what I do for that many months or year or however long it takes to write that book. December Park is one of the very few that I wrote um, the first draft in high school. Um, and really I wrote it as a way, I was, I was writing all these short stories that, that turned into novel manuscripts when I was like 15, 16, 17. And I was trying to get my friends to read it and nobody wanted to read all that <laughs> stuff. So I said, all right, I'll write a story with you, and you knuckleheads will be the main characters in it, but here's the book. Go ahead, read it, tell me what you think now. So that's how it started. And it that's was smart. It had, yeah, right. <laughs> I thought so. They didn't. Um, but uh, yeah, I think the first draft, the first draft of that book was called The House in the Woods back then. And it was the, the, the antagonist was a, a supernatural entity more like in line with Pennywise and it and that sort of thing. Okay. Um, and it didn't work for, you know, I, it was too close to that arena. So I let that book sit for, man, years and uh, maybe 15 years before I realized what the nexus was. And there was two things I realized that was going to make that book work. One was that the, it had to be uh, a realistic murderer and not a, not something supernatural just to fit that the story. And that too, I had to take a step back from those main characters and write them a little bit less like myself and the people I knew in order to keep the drama and the tension in that book because the characters were too close to the people I knew and they really what we were friends and there really wasn't uh, a lot of that tension and you know I just had to go in there and tweak the personalities a little bit and that's what made it click for me. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. That reminds me a lot of all of that drama I've seen recently on Twitter. I don't remember who exactly started it, but it was some author had talked about how, you know, she basically just takes her friends and their lives and then just writes them into the story, which then sparked everybody to talk about, you know, both sides of the fence, which is like, oh, no, it's totally wrong and immoral for you to take real life people and turn them into your fictional characters. And then there was other people who were like, what the fuck else do you do? Like, that's what we do. <laughs> yeah. We yeah. we observe people in our lives and then we write about them. Like yeah. that person that was just being honest about it. <laughs> yeah, we all we all do. I was yeah. going to say we're all screwed then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just a mashup of all sorts of people, you know. It's funny. Um, I was talking to my neighbors. We got a pretty close knit street here. And when COVID first hit and I was I was in the middle of writing Come With Me and I was trying to think of another book after that, uh, I said, yeah, you know, I said, I'm thinking about writing a book that takes place, you know, on a, on a suburban street that deals with not this pandemic, but a pandemic that has to create distance between people. And they can't be around each other, similar to what we're going through. But it takes place on a street where everybody is a swinger. Like they're all like, how would that disrupt the culture of that block when they couldn't touch each other or who's, you know, and of yeah. course, I'm like, well, you've got to put us in the, like, not that, look, my block isn't a bunch of swingers, but <laughs> just for the record, no. but I'm like, but that's how your, you know, your mind works. You're like, oh, that's kind of, that, that could be interesting. People are going to start getting on Google maps and trying to find out where you are. <laughs> I know his address. <laughs> that's, that's right. <laughs> Well, we can't talk about December Park, one of my favorite Malfi books, without talking about one of my favorite Richard Chismar books, um, which you wrote with your son, which is Widow's Point. Um, mm. I absolutely love this. I mean, it's, it's small. It's not like, you know, the biggest 
book but i mean in terms of like packing enough thrills and chills into this plus it was illustrated which i always love um i don't think we ever like grow up past like wanting pictures in our books like i right, wish right. more horror novels would have illustrations um but tell me about writing this with your son like how did that come about it uh you know i, I was asked to write uh, i'm trying to think um the name of the uh, anthology now it was by uh, edited by a guy named Mark Parker and he wanted he wanted uh, sea, st sea stories, horror stories. And I figured everyone was going to write ab about things happening on ships and they would do a much better job than me. So I thought, you know what, let's do let's do something about a lighthouse. Um, and, I, and I talked about it with my son and he, he you know, really sparked to the idea. And we had we had always wanted to write something together. So he said, all right, Dad, you write the opening, you kind of create the history of the place and then I'll jump in and, and we'll go from there. So it, it was just, uh, you know, it's only about 20, it's, it's, I mean, it's definitely just a novella, um, mm -hmm. 20, 20 something thousand words. Um, and it originally for the anthology, it was, it was about a, I think a 9,000 word story. Um, and what was funny is just probably about a month after it was published, I texted my son who was up in Maine at college at the time. And I just said, Bill, I can't stop thinking about the story. I think, I think there's more to it. And he said that I, I agree. It's not done. It's not done. So that's where the book came from is we kind of, you know, we, we more than doubled it in length and, and really went into it a little bit more. And, um, you know, that was one of those things where when the reviews came out and they were they were mostly positive, fortunately, because I told them when we were finished, I said, all right, Billy, this is our everything but the kitchen sink book, because it's you know, it does not break new ground. It's a yeah. traditional supernatural story, which uh, everybody loves. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? What was interesting is I didn't realize I had never really written anything that overtly supernatural. Um, and I remember some early reviews of my first collection that were very positive, but keyed in on the fact that I don't, you know, Ed Bryan and Locust said something, uh, and I'm definitely just kind of paraphrasing, but essentially he said, you know, um, you can tell that Chismar doesn't quite buy, you know, supernatural yet in his, you know, he's, he's not going to try to sell you in that, you know, was, my stories were more crime and suspense and human, you know, uh, the dark side of humanity, that kind of thing. So it was really fun to do this, um, you know, all these years later. And I remember at some point, uh, Billy, Billy uh, sent me a draft and this is when we were finished, but we were just fiddling with things. And I said, all right, Billy, this is your version is everything, including the kitchen sink. And it's too much. So we had to take some stuff out. And, and um, but yeah, it was fun. I mean, and the whole again, I, I wish I could, you know, lay claim to it. But when the reviews started coming out, um, one of the things that people started keying on was the fact that it was kind of a found footage, you know, pro story. Yeah. And I, I wish I should lie and say, well, we knew we were doing that from the start, <laughs> and, you know, but we had no idea. It's just how the story again needed to be told. And, um, we both kind of looked at each other, you know, after the fact, when the reviews started coming and say, Hey, yeah, you know, they're right. So, but yeah, no, it was just, a, it was a, it was a blast. And, um, we're actually going to write the sequel to it very, very soon. Is um, so Billy, to, right? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Are we going to ask the same question? I, was gonna I don't know. Billy still writing. Yeah. I, it would be a writer. It, it was like a sub question. It was like, is he going to be a writer? And then also, is he like a beta reader for you as well? For all um, your books? Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes he usually, God bless him. You know, he's 22. So he's, busy and he's bouncing around and sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll sit there and I'll say, Billy, do me a favor and read this. You know, let me know when you get a chance, read this and let me know what you think. And there it is a week later. And I'm like, <laughs> just shaking my head going, Billy, you know, but um, yeah, he just graduated in the spring and uh, last summer he wrote the first draft of a novel. Um, he's been doing a second draft of it this summer, as well as polishing up about a dozen short stories that he wants to put together. Um, that have been uh, that have been sold to to you know smaller markets. Um, so yeah, he definitely wants to try his hand at it. He uh, he loves directing and and screenwriting too. Um, we we co-wrote a script with Mark Pavia uh, called Trapped, which is, was based on on an idea that Stephen King and I came up with for a short film that Billy directed. Um, but we wrote a, a feature version of it, and that's being cast right now. So hope you know fingers crossed that that happens, and 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 Billy you know, had a hand in, in the writing of that. So, yeah, you know, I, I told him as long as you're ready to be poor for a while and maybe <laughs> full time, then absolutely chase it and do what you want. And um, yeah, he, he's, he's uh, going to make a go for it, you know, of it one way or another. That's really cool. 
Uh, Ronald, do you have family members that read your work? No, they hate my books. <laughs> 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 it's funny oh, yeah. because they, it's some people, some authors don't let their family read them, and then some authors are like that they're their first beta readers. So my 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 parents read them, um, and my wife reads them, and uh, generally, like my wife and my dad are sort of my sounding boards. Where like they know, like uh, once I start writing a book. I'm in that weird spot where I just kind of mope around the house. I don't get dressed for two days. I kind of, I get an idea and I jot it on like a napkin or the wall or something. I just kind of, I get into like this weird funk and then I'm always hitting them with like these bizarre, you know, Hey, if you were in a root cellar for six days, what would you eat first? <laughs> and, they're like, and they're like, what are you, what are you talking about? So they're kind of used to that. So by the time I actually start writing it and giving them the, the work, they go, oh, okay, you're not just losing your mind. This is what this is about. Um, you know, so both of them and, and my dad and my, my wife have pretty good, uh, a pretty good bullshit detector when, you know, they could, they don't have a problem pushing the button and going, ah, all right, this, you phoned it in here. This is crap, you know? And so, and I trust, I trust them on that. So, yeah, but as far as family members go, it's, it's basically the three of them and my, my 98 year old grandmother, she used to read my stuff, but now it's like, she, she reads one page and has to go back and reread it. Cause she forgets. <laughs> <laughs> She's still on page one. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I always wonder about the bias of family members. Like, are are they a true resource, you know, or are they just like, you know, love everything you do? Like, I I, I probably wouldn't be able to use my mom because she's all she loves everything that I do. So I would have to use somebody who's mm -hmm. <laughs> a little more um, biased. I think my husband is pretty biased, actually. He he will call me out on my shit. <laughs> now they're, they're pretty critical. Uh, yeah, I yeah. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. If you find someone who who is honest with you, you know, hang on to that. Cause I've, I've, you know, I've never been one who like, I hear about, you know, beta readers and you, you know, a, a lot of really successful writers who, who I admire, you know, they're like, I've got these six people and I'm like six. No, you know, that's like a nightmare for me. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of it is because of the, the film work I've done where, you know, you write a script that you're really proud of, you know, you're really proud to have your name on it and you're paid a, a, a really fair wage for it. And then by the time it goes through, you know, various producers and financers and, um, and, and, and even actors and, and actresses, you know, making their changes, you know, it's, it's, you know, you still get to cash the check, but it's no longer something you're proud to put your name on. Um, so I think that's why, you know, beta readers kind of scare me, but, but speaking of being honest, yeah, Billy, when he does read it, he will, t he will, he'll, he'll call it like it is, which is a good thing. Yeah. That's a good thing. So, uh, go ahead, Ash. Sadie's been doing this thing on her Patreon, like, uh, what else do you do or do you do? And I was just curious, like, what are your other things that you guys are into outside of writing? Ron's a rock star. Yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah, Ron's, we had his Every TV time he throws something, I'm like, son of a bitch, I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> well, Rich is an athlete. so <laughs> Not really. I mean, yeah, what do I do anymore? Right. I got, I Compared to me, you're an athlete. <laughs> you're you're an athlete. Olympian. Yeah. yeah. Now I'm like, I, I go out and fish and I play some golf and, you know, then, I, then I'm like, this is why I'm a writer. I want to go home again. <laughs> Well, that's um, what's so funny about the dichotomy of what R Ronald does, because when you picture a writer, it's this very writerly kind of like typewriter guy behind a desk. But then his other alter ego is like this badass rock star with his hair flying all over the place, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's funny. I, I, I'm, I'm an extreme introvert by nature, but when necessary, I can go the other way pretty comfortably. But my, my you know, my preference is to be by myself watching a movie, eating Frankenberry cereal. That's, that's what I do. <laughs> Yeah, but, I, but you're right. I see the pictures and he's like, his hair's flying. He's sweaty. And I'm yeah. like, I'm a bitch. But you know what? So my, my favorite part of playing in, in a band is I love the performance aspect. I love writing the music. And my band is my brother's the drummer. I got two of my best friends in the other in the band. And uh, that's my favorite part. I, I hate the show up three hours ahead of time, hang around for four hours after the fact. You know, it's it's a bunch of sweaty, drunken people who you don't know tussling through p past you in, in a crowded club. And man, I'd rather just I, I usually cut out and go to the bar next door where it's quiet yeah. and have a drink. <laughs> so who who are easier on you, your rock star fans or your book fans? Uh, easier on me? Yeah. Um, like, do you read your reviews and stuff or like yeah, yeah, listen I read to them. commentary and all that? Yeah. I, I mean, you know what? I, I think um, 
I don't know who's easier, but I will say this. I was, it's very few crossovers in those genres. I thought people who read my books would listen to my music and the other way around. Yeah. It doesn't, doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, so, um, which, which is fine. It's, it's a whole new, you know, uh, you know, base of people to, to listen to and what and read what you do. Um, but you know what? I, I find people to be equally as, uh, you know, gloating and uh, about you or ready to criticize you. I think probably, yeah. probably I get more criticism with the books only because I think it's a lot easier with books to, I see a lot of criticism online and I think it's a lot easier than somebody coming up to your face after a show and going, you suck. <laughs> you <know? laughs> so and that, that has happened, but not as frequently. <laughs> they're, they're not as tough in real life. That's that is, that sure. is true. That's true. <laughs> Richard, what's your favorite sport to play? Um, you know what? My, both of my sons like to play golf now, so I have fun going out and play golf. It's just it takes so damn long. Yeah, you know, the idea of devoting like four hours to it, you know, and then and I have friends who will like they'll drive an hour and a half one way to go play a you know four or five hour round of golf, and I'm just like I can't do it, which is why, you know, in the previous ten years I probably played golf maybe a half dozen times a summer, but now both both guys you know both my sons play, so it's it's fun to go out there and spend that time with them, and it's you know. And, and it's just you and and them and um, but yeah, I mean yeah, I mean I used to, I played lacrosse in high school and college. I went to college and on a lacrosse scholarship and and loved that. And both of my sons played in high school and they're both uh, Billy played for Colby up in Maine in college. Um, Noah's going to the University of Virginia to play uh, and, and actually he moves out a month from this week. So. I'll be mourning that he, he moves in the day after uh, Boogeyman comes out. So Aww. that's the only. It, you know, it'll be good that it'll get a little bit lost in the shuffle of that because, yeah, when Billy moved out, I was miserable. Yeah. Um, but now he's home, so that's cool. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'll be miserable in a month. But, but yeah, and, and you know, I've like I said, I've got an 18 and 22 year old. So on any given day, I'm getting, you know, abused playing basketball or, you know, golf turns into, you know, wrestling in the middle of the fairway. <laughs> so, yeah, those athletic days are in the past. <laughs> and and golf was the really only sport that was like still going during coronavirus. Like I, I heard closed down. I mean, it, they did, like at least here in Maryland. I know yeah. I have friends who work at golf courses and, and they were out of work. And then then they brought it back. You just couldn't ride a cart. You could play, but you had to walk. Right. Um, right. Different things. But it's yeah. one of the few like contactless sports, though, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, and and you get to be primarily outside. So right. I, I heard that it did really well. Um, my gr my father in law plays, and then my son kind of kind of plays, and my husband. But um, it's just an expensive sport too. I think when you start getting into it, like buying all the clubs and then going and playing can cost you know one hundred and sixty dollars for a round of golf. So yeah, that, that's uh, I was gonna say if if and, and then you know half the people play you know they pay the 160 and they're miserable the whole round and they're cussing and throwing clubs and i'm just yeah. like, that's <laughs> what i try to tell my sons i'm like look if you're going to do this really you know you, they're you know they're hardcore athletes so i understand that competitive spirit but i'm like golf is not the sport to to go into and and you just got to go it's it's kind of like fishing you know what it's better than being at home in the office um even if you don't catch fish um you know but that's a perfect example. My oldest son can go out there and fish for three hours and, and he enjoys nature. And if he doesn't catch a fish, that's all right. My youngest son just enjoys catching. He doesn't enjoy the whole fishing aspect. Yeah. Yeah. It's good to have, it's good to have a break from your writing desk. I'm sure. Yeah. I, I take long breaks in between because when I write, I was listening close to, to what Ron said about when he gets into a project, because when I write, I, I tend to get, I tend to, I'm not really good with boundaries um, and I've never been able to fit into that mold of, you know, wake up and write for a couple hours a day and then quit and go and do my thing or four hours and, or get my five pages when I'm writing. I'm just, it's like flying out of me. Um, and I do get obsessive. My laptop goes with me everywhere. I embarrass my family because it will go into a restaurant with us just in case I need to, get something down really quick. Um, and I'm up in the middle of the night writing on my phone and at red lights and it, it, it's bad. I, I need to figure out at age 50 something how to do better. Mm -hmm. um, but that's also why they come out really quickly. Um, you know, Boogeyman was 90 something thousand words and, and the first, I wrote the first draft in like three months. Um, but wow, that is fast. Yeah, it was pretty quick. And, and same thing with 
the the books I wrote with with Steve King came out really quickly. The second one or the the third one though is a full length novel, and like the first one, and they both just you know they the, I mean it flew. Um, and uh, I don't think he was used to someone keeping up with him, you know, <laughs> speed wise. But I'm just like you know I, I can't help it. I need to. For my for my sake and for my families, I need to figure out how to do better. Um, yeah, and just so like if worms don't know that the one he wrote with Stephen King is Gwendy's Button Box, which is funny because I got this in the Nocturnal Readers box, but it was like a special edition, and I wanted this cover, so I had to buy this from yeah. Cemetery Dance because it matched the cover of so the you got second two book. covers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but the so the, the other one um, was a solo effort uh, for you, right, Richard? You right. Were, yeah. The, this one yourself and then did i hear that a third was coming or it is it's coming out in february um and this is a, a full length uh novel it's you know i don't know how many words it is but um yeah the, the third one was steve's idea and he you know i started getting these texts one sunday night well, what do you think about this and all you know what do you think about that and the text started getting longer and longer and i'm like he's excited yeah um, and by the end of that night we were like okay we'll uh you know we'll block some time and do it and so yeah. he's going to join you on the third one? Oh yeah, it's finished. It's it's all turned oh, in. Oh wow! We'll so how did that friendship publish in February? Up. And then uh, Gallery Simon Schuster will publish that summer. Oh cool. Well, Ashley, did you say something? Sorry, I was I was just curious <laughs> how how the whole Stephen King and you be started writing together. I just was curious. Um, your guess is as good that. as mine, honestly. <laughs> um, you know, I've known him for a long time, and we had done business for quite a while. Um, and at some point the business turned into a friendship. I mean, we, you know, we would text pretty much daily about whether it's about books or movies or life, you know, we're both family guys, um, our dogs, baseball, a lot of baseball, um, not so much this year cause the Orioles suck. Um, but, uh, it's just that. And, and we rarely s talked about writing, um, every once in a while, um, you know, we would, we would discuss that stuff, but, um, it, one day we were talking about collaborations and, and I was specifically talking about, um, round Robin projects where you have like eight different authors or five different authors involved, but somehow it was got on the subject of collaborations. He said, I have something I've never been able to finish. And he sent it to me the next day and just said, do, do what you want with it. And I, you know, I, I stared at it for a while and said, you mean you want me to try to finish it? And he said, if you want to, and that's how it happened. I mean, again, it wasn't, he had just finished reading a collection of mine and, and I, and I guess he enjoyed it. So that's kind of where the, the, the uh, trust on his part came from. So, but uh, cool. yeah, still like, you know, ridiculous dream come true. Uh, yeah. You know, still, you know, I, I give you that whole story and I still have no idea how it happened. So. Well, he follows Sadie on Twitter so everyone knows. Awesome. No, don't say that. It is. It's like that day was so funny because I was at my mom and dad's um, just for the first time seeing them since the whole like COVID thing. Um, and I woke up early in the morning and, and I was looking at the morning light shining on my mom's uh, bookcases. And she is like the OG Stephen King fan. Like she has all the first editions. My dad buys her like ridiculously priced first editions and signed copies and stuff. And so I just took a picture and was like, Hey, I'm like chilling at my mom and dad's like, here's my mom's awesome Stephen King collection. And then I put my phone aside and I jumped in bed with her and we were eating breakfast in bed. My dad brought us like breakfast in bed and we were just giggling and laughing and having fun. And then I checked my phone and I like started crying. <laughs> <laughs> and my mom's like, what's the matter? Did something happen? And I was like, look, and I showed it to her and she's like, oh my God. We both like flip the fuck out. Like, <laughs> and like right around your birthday or something or like right before your birthday. Um, I remember you like text me right away and you're like, Oh my God. I'm like, what? Someone dying? Like, I'm so scared. <laughs> that was, it was just really weird. It was just really like to know that like, and I'm sure you guys both can relate to this, but to know that this person that you has been a part of your life since forever, you can imagine like, then they like they know you or you exist. It's pretty surreal. It's really weird. Like, you just, trip out on it every now and then. In fact, the weird thing that I was going to say too, is when I was reading the, um, when I was reading some of the things, the blurbs here, um, Richard, you like blurbed come with me. 
um, and also a few other authors that I was noticing that people made lots of comparisons to Stephen King with Ronald Malfi's work. And I think that that's super legit. And then also, Richard, on your book, people make comparisons to Stephen King and your work. And that's why I think your guys' voices blend so well together on Gwendy. And I think it's accurate for, for Ronald Malfi too. I mean, people try to, they throw that around a lot. Oh, it's like Stephen King this and Stephen King that, and it's not always like a good fit, you right, know? Right. But for, I think for both of you, like especially in December Park and also your short story collection, Ronald, like there are some very Stephen King-esque aspects to both of your work. And is he like a huge influence for you guys? Oh yeah, I mean, I grew, I grew up, Reading, I mean, that's the reason I think I became a writer is, is reading Stephen King. Um, yeah. And probably anybody my age who writes in this genre will, will say that. Um, you know, and those, those you know, you do hear it. every time a new horror writer comes out, it's, oh, it's just like Stephen King. And that's a sure. double-edged sort of thing. You're like, well, at one regard, it's a little cringeworthy. And, it, you know, and you, you don't want to sound so myopic where it's like, well, there's only one horror writer you can compare this guy to. It's, it's Stephen King. Yeah. Um, but I do see I do see the similarities, and, and you know, it's just like anything else. If you learn to play music by listening to the Beatles, you know, your your stuff will have have tenants of that style of music in it. I sure. think it's the same with with writing. Um, you know, and I think anytime you're going to write about small towns, they're going to make that connection. You know, but with uh, you know, going back to Ron's book, the new one um, that I blurbed. Um, I was going to say when you talked about how big it was, that's, you know, it's 400 pages. It's, <laughs> yeah. It's still, it's still uh, one of those books you're going to read in a day or two. That's, uh, yeah. I, I, love, I, I guarantee you he's going to get that a bunch next week. Um, you know, when the book hits wide, he's going to get a bunch. Of, I read it in a day or two. And to me, that's the, that's still, you know, one of the highest compliments you can get because, uh, you know, uh, I know I've written some stuff and I look at it and I'm like, oh, it's clunk clunky as hell or whatever. But you know what? If they sat down and it took them, you know, they say it took six hours to, to read or whatever and they, they couldn't move. I'm like, you know what? At least they got their money's worth. They did their job. You yeah. Know? With this one, you know, I, I just, you know, I read it very quickly and you couldn't have had that much fun writing it because it's, <laughs> it's yeah, I mean, it's it's a great story, but it's dark. And right in the you know in the heart. Stop! You're gonna make me want to read it right now, and I don't have time. Like I, that, I know, but that always happens to me. I'll be like, okay, I'm almost done with these like three that I have to read and review, and then all of a sudden this shows up, and I'm like, shit! I'm just gonna jump right into that one. No, you well, gotta he, wait. He said it'll only it'll only take you a day, so <laughs> <laughs> it'll, you you won't stop turning pages. I, I just know like December Park it was dark, you know, but it, it because of you know as soon as you said they were the, you know this it was modeled on your childhood or your youth, and and then I, I was curious whether you enjoyed it because like with Boogeyman I had a blast because yeah. I was writing about real people and I even used their real names. I mean Simon Schuster had to you know I made them a nervous wreck. The lawyers <laughs> I had to get a lot of things signed by by people, but. You know, in your case, it, it uh, you know, with this one, I just I looked at it and I'm like, this. I think it's your best book. I think it's one of the best books I've read this year. And I'm glad you wrote it instead of me because it, it hurt me to read it. <laughs> ah. it was me, but it was still, it was like, wow, you know, it's a ride. Well, it's, you know, it's people, you know, that's kind of you know a cliche you use a lot where it's like, this is a you know, you're taking a journey with the author. In this case, you really are. It's like, why are you guys always trying to kill us? Like, that's what that, I feel like that's your guys' main goal is to, like, hurt us so bad. Like, that's, you know, with this book and then with razor blade tears. And then, you know, I've been reading Joe Lansdale and I'm just like, ugh, ugh, you know, and like everything stabs me to death. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Razor blade tears. Yeah, and, and Cosby's awesome. His stuff is great. And Lansdale is he's a god. But, you know, what I, I mean. To answer your question, Rich, uh, I wouldn't say it was fun. I mean, different books are, are, you know, as you know, they come from a different part of you. Um, December Park was fun. This was more, um, I felt a little bit out of necessity uh, that it ha I had the story come to me really hard all at once. And I and I really wanted to write it. But I think more than fun, I would say it was, it was gratifying. I, I mm -hmm. very, very rarely am I able to, I think, write a write a book and translate it from my head to the page so close without losing a lot of stuff. And, and it's very, to me, that's the mark for my, myself as whether or not a book is successful, how close I get that thing on the page to what I originally thought of in my head, not just story, but feeling, emotion, atmosphere, what what it, what it creates in my head when I think about it on that page. Uh, mm -hmm. this, this book 
came pretty damn close to that. So for me, that it was more gratifying than fun, I guess. Uh, and yeah, it's a little, you know, the subject matter is dark. Uh, so I don't know, it seems a little, you know, to, to say it's fun to write about dead people. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Um, There's just such that sense of melancholy that runs through it, but it's, yeah, like I said, I think it's your your best book, and I, I can you know that what you just described makes total sense to me because it, it comes across on the page, and uh, I think people are going to be blown away. Well, thanks, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. I think that's something that readers admire so much about authors. It's like I'm a reader. I I don't write or anything, but um, like Sadie was saying, with like trying to kill us, that um we all have like these feelings, but like for me, it's like, I can't get these words out on paper and for you guys to like convey them and for us to be like, yeah, like that's exactly how I felt. Like, how did they know? And it just feels like so relatable and it just leaves us with this feeling like we're broken now. It's great. <laughs> well, that's, that's one of the reasons I fell in love with Steve King's work at such a young age is it's just, I felt like, all right, this guy, you know, you're, you're already running around at a time in your life where you, you know, a lot of the world's starting to not make sense to you and you're kind of feeling, you know, alienated no matter how, no matter how lucky you are with a great family and great group of friends or whatever, you're still feeling, you know, a lot of things. And when I started reading Steve's work, um, it was like, okay, this guy kind of has a, <clears throat> uh, you know, a secret door into my, into my soul. Yeah. And in my neighborhood and in my town. And, and uh, that was it was really eye opening for me. And I just I remember probably just like Ronnie said, he grew up on it. Um, I remember thinking to myself, you know, uh, what a cool thing to be able to do to other people. And uh, yeah, I, you know, I wrote my stories and tri <clears throat> tried to sell them for a nickel a piece. And my mom was the only one who bought them. So <laughs> yeah, we we're, were pretty much the same there. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing about the underlying theme between King's work and both of you is character driven horror. I mean, anytime you bring to life people on the page that I'm investing in and that I'm falling in love with, there's the opportunity for you to hurt me with those mm -hmm. people, you know, because they're in danger or they're in peril or something is coming after them or they have to fight something. And it's just like the whole time I'm on the edge of my seat being like, please don't take this person from me, you know? And there's, there's just like, there's certain characters that like I will never forgive authors for. Like there's certain things that happen to them where I'm like, that really hurt. Like I took that personally, you know, or that like made me cry or I won't forget that. And I think that that's just good art when you can really invade um, into somebody's you know, whole being and affect them that way is like really important and powerful. Or um, certain quotes too, because we just, yeah. well, I, I read for the first time The Body last month and Sadie reread it with us. And uh, gosh, that quote about having friends when you're 11 and Jesus does anyone like, oh, yeah. that's just like, that quote is just, I want to put it everywhere. I just think about yeah. it all the time. I love it. Yeah, that's really important. Well, we're getting close to our 45 minute ish hour mark. I mean, we could sit here and talk to you guys forever, but I did want to just leave the door open for both of you to go ahead and just like if you if there's anything you want to tell the readers, the Nightworms readers right before they get your book, like if there's any message you want to send to them or anything, go ahead. Like now's your time. Go ahead, Ronald. Uh, well, I, I want to thank everybody who showed the interest in the book and, and for you guys for, for getting it out there. Um, I'm just really, you know, I'm really excited about this one and uh, I feel really good about it too. Uh, I, I think it's probably the, you know, to echo Rich, I think it's one of my strongest books. I'm really excited about it and the re reviews so far have been good. And, uh, you know, I think when, when you read it uh, and you see where it came from and the reason I had to write it, I think it'll, it'll even kind of speak more. Uh, for itself than I could right now, but I don't want to give anything away. But uh, come with me, and it's it's out in stores uh, July twentieth. But I think it's snuck out snuck out a little earlier. I've seen it. I, it kind of pissed me off, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and Richard, is there anything you want to say? Um, just to, to echo his thoughts, thank you guys for including it in the uh, in the box, and I hope everybody enjoys it. I'm not going to talk too much about it, just because. Um, yeah, you know, there are some surprises in there, you know, in addition to story to, you know, the formatting of it and, and kind of the, the uh, <clears throat> you know, the setup of it. So I just let people go in kind of blind and, and hopefully they'll dig it and, 
you know, they'll come to me afterwards and I'm sure they'll have a bunch of questions. And I'm not as confident as Ron is. I, I had a blast writing it. Um, <laughs> views have been good, but it's different enough. And it and it's, you know, I'm an old guy who's been doing this for a long time. And this is kind of my first big full length thing. And especially for another publisher. So, you know, I've kind of been hustling my ass off trying to, you know, make sure, you know, I feel I feel responsible and I, and I wanted to do well for him. So. I'm uh, I'm not going to be nearly as relaxed as Ron is for this next month. I'm going to be a nervous wreck. And, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I'm very grateful for the whole thing. And thank you guys. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to speak for Ashley, but I mean, when we were planning this package, it was just the perfect storm putting these two books together with the small town theme. It's like two of our most highly anticipated books for the year. Um, and we'll probably be reading them along with all the nightworms when they get them in August. So we're yeah, really excited about it. Thank you. And Rich, we got to do a signing or something together. This is. I was just going to say, if, if you ever <laughs> pair us up again next time we do this, we should be in the same room. Yeah. We'll after dinner, and then we'll come out. We'll come back and do this, and it'll be fun. But yeah, well, let's do a signing. Let's let's absolutely. Um, let's figure something out for for August or September. Absolutely, I'll throw some ideas your way. That'd be great. Okay. Thanks. Cool. Well, you guys heard it first. These two are going to like hook up. So, <laughs> all right. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and end the broadcast. You two don't go anywhere though. We want to just say goodbye. Okay. Bye nightworms. Bye.